It's the hottest day of the year. And boy, oh boy, do I have some work to do. 48 volt, 230 amp hours. Today, we'll be taking a look at this Orient Power 230 amp hour or 11.7 kilowatt hour lithium iron phosphate battery. Coming in at just over 85 kilos plus the packing, it's gonna be a bit of a challenge to get it up on my desk. But let's pull the box apart, take a look at what's inside and have a look at what we're working with. On the top of the box, we've got a couple of mounts there. We've got the hardware to actually install the battery to attach the cables, Cat5 cable, bit of a checklist sheet. And then underneath that, we've got one hell of a challenge to get this thing out of the box. We've got a pair of heavy duty handles at the bottom, much like this 100 amp hour unit. That'll be enough. At this point, I don't know if it's a good plan, but it's definitely a plan. What could go wrong? It's not how you should get it up onto the bench, but it definitely worked. Don't try this at home, kids. Set up a little bit of a test rig here. We got the MultiPlus to actually charge the battery up. When we, the battery arrived, it only had 56% state of charge, uh, and the voltage was 52.656 volts. And down below here, we've got the minimum was 3.29 volts, and then 3.29 again. So it was perfectly balanced according to this software when we got the battery so pretty stoked with that and the battery temperature was actually 33 degrees which was nowhere near as hot as the rest of my workshop having a quick look at the little control panel so to speak on here we got the positive and negative self-explanatory we did get a couple of um, little boots that i neglected to put on so far on this side we've got a 250 amp hour breaker we got a little on off indicator we have a reset switch, we have an ADS, and that is so you can select the dip switches so you can have multiple of these batteries all running underneath the one battery management system. Run an alarm down the bottom with a state of charge. We've got a DCT, which is dry contact points, and there's two there. We've got RS485A, CAN bus RS323, so the RS323 actually goes into this little adapter which goes into USB into the computer. That is not included and I will leave a link to the correct one in the description below. And then we've got RS485B and 485C on this side. So they link up if you multiple the batteries up so the battery management systems can talk to each other. With that, we're gonna start the discharge test and let's see if we can hit that 11,706 watt hours as advertised. All right, we're set up and ready to go for the capacity test. I've got my shop lights, I've got my router, and then I've got something else on that one. Oh, that's the laptop. And then I've got uh, the shop fan on that one. So I should only be pulling about 500 watts. Uh, for reference, with the car going past, uh, we're starting this test at 100% state of charge, uh, 53.9 volts. And down the bottom there, we've got battery cycle of one. Now we saw before the voltage for the mins and max was pretty bloody close at half voltage. I haven't actually seen this yet. So what have we got? Uh, given that it hasn't been charged and top balanced, I'd say that's not a problem, but it might affect my results. I do have screen capture on, so we're gonna be able to see that the whole way through. Uh, I also have the Victron Energy app once that's actually all plugged in and turned on, ready to go. Of course, you can't see it. So let's send it and hopefully we don't have to do this twice because this is going to take a while with this beauty. Okay, first battery, turn the power on, turn the inverter on, a couple of clicks. It's got no 240 volt. So we're getting information across here. 
and let's have a look on the Victron. So we've got nothing happening here. We've got seven watts out. So we turn on uh, maybe the shop lights. So there are all my LED lights up there. And that brings it up to 150 watts, 160 watts. Uh, turn on the router. So we've got internet, 10 more watts. And then we turn on my laptop. There we go. And we're charging on the laptop. 230 watts. And we turn on the big shop fan there. Ah, that was melodramatic. Ah, almost fell over. There we go. This is going to make it noisy. There we go, we turn on the shop fan. And we're pulling 500 watts. So let's run that all night. I'll come back in the morning and hopefully we have a result. And we got, got that laid up a little bit better, pulling just on 500 watts, which is kind of where I want it to be. Um, that'll do 2000 watts the inverter, but I really didn't want to plug that much stuff in and draw it from it. We're pulling about 10 amps, so we'll see you in about 23 hours. We're coming to the conclusion of our first test. First test, because I'm going to do another one charging. I'm going to recharge the battery again, and then I'm going to charge my electric car at 1700 watts and see what we get. So that'll be next, so stick around for that. But we've got the run and the alarm flashing. Uh, we've got the SOC all the way down the bottom. Now we've been running a 2000 watt load to a 200 watt load today. Uh, more typically, it sort of floated around the 500 to 600 watts. Uh, I think there was a period of time there it was about 400 watts for a few hours. Um, but very much a real world test. We got 2.915 volts and 2.853 volts for the minimum. We've got 27, well, 7.2 amp hours left in the battery, and we're still drawing 10 and a half amps, almost 11 amps with 46 volts left in the battery. And we look over here, we are still drawing 468 watts. The Victron is reporting 4.6, uh, 46.16. I'm getting tired in 11 amps. It would be great to capture this going dark on camera. We now have a yellow light, 4.395 volts. So I'd say the end is imminent. Uh, cell 11 has dropped to 2.61 volts. So we might actually turn that fan off just so you guys get a better experience. Even though that will prolong the, um, uh, the turning off a little bit. So now we're, we turn the fan off, so we've dropped to 300 watts. So we dropped about 150 odd watts there. That lower cell is 2.59 volts. The entire battery voltage is 43.83. I'm not sure if I said it before, but I can't remember what the actual shut off voltage is. Um, I did print out the manual and I could probably have a look at that while I'm standing here. Uh, temperature, voltage, temperature, technical information, 85 kilos. Panel view. I just heard a click. Ah, that's interesting. We've just got a low battery alarm on the inverter itself. So the inverter might spoil our fun. I didn't think to check whether the two low voltages were the same figure. 
one of those cells there is now at 2.5 volts. We've got 4.6 amp hours remaining in the battery. That low battery alarm looks like it's angry. It's flashing away, as well as the notification up here on the screen. Drawing almost 7 amps and 300 watts, just on 300 watts. Still got 2% left. This noise is me looking at the instructions. Uh, discharge. BMS discharge cutoff voltage um, is 42 volts, which we are near. Hey, there we go, and that ends it. There we go, we got some lights back on again. So, as we just saw, the inverter low voltage cut out killed our party, but we have remaining capacity. Wait a minute, why did that drop out? Ah, the battery's gone as well. So the battery shut down. So the battery shut down in the 30 seconds it took me to pull the power out from there and put it back into the wall. But we could see there that we had just under 5 amp hours remaining. We got 43 volts there. So that concludes test number one. Okay. Second test, we have one battery cycle. We are fully charged again, so we charge back up throughout the day. And I did green charge it with that battery and a lot of extra solar, but we're good to go. We've got no output there. The battery's full. The second test is going to be my EV. Just gonna grab the standard EV charger. Should start doing inverter stuff up there soon. AC out. I just heard the car activate, 66 watts, 19 watts, this should go to about 1750 watts, so it should be a pretty good test. So that is saying it's charging, and on an MG you can tell it's charging by the very dim pulsing of the MG logo. We're pulling 1750 watts. We are pulling 35 amps from the batteries, which is a good load. So we'll see you in a good few hours and see what we've got for capacity with a 1700 watt, oh, 1750 watt continuous load on the battery. So I reckon this will be another good test. Taking a quick look at the actual dash of the car, it's showing it'll take about 17 hours to charge at this rate. And we've currently got 29% in the car. So once it's finished charging, we'll take another look and see how much range we've got in the car for the 11 and a half kilowatt hours we can potentially take out of that battery. Test isn't complete yet, but I need some sleep. It's 1 a.m. We've got 11% left. But we've only got 26 million, oh, 26 amp hours left in the battery, and it's still going. I would have anticipated I would have only got about 200 amp hours out of the battery. And sleep had to come back out. An hour later. And she's shut down, but I'm going to have to wait to go through the footage to see how much capacity it had. Saying 0% there, but we'll work it out properly. Go to the car. 129 kilometers, 54%. So I did about 25% of the battery from memory. So not bad. In the last 10 minutes of discharging the Orient Power battery, it dropped from 48.77 volts 
to 34.4 volts. Towards the end we see a few low battery yellow indicators then the test ends shortly after with a result of 3.31 kilowatt hours remaining in the battery. That result certainly wasn't expected. Now it's time to disassemble the battery, take a look inside and check out the build quality. With the nine Phillips head screws removed, three on each side, the sides and the back, there is none on the front. You lift it up a little bit and simply pull it back and that reveals what appears to be a very well laid out battery. With our first glance inside the battery, it looks very well laid out. We've got numbering of all the cells. Uh, we have witness marks or a little pen on each of the cells for where they've been torqued down or at least tightened up so we can see if anything has moved in shipping. I really like seeing that. We've got a couple of temperature sensors that I can see here. So there's four temperature sensors, perhaps there's more down the bottom there, evenly distributed. They are at the top of the battery pack rather than between the cells, but that would be hard, I guess. Uh, there's fish paper between all cells and front and rear. We've got the two big bits of steel across the top, which hold the cells in place and are very easily removed by two screws at each end, which makes maintaining the pack a lot easier. We've got the positive and the negative terminal down there. Looking down on the battery management system, we can see the BMS leads come in this side and attach to the motherboard there. We've got the negative on a solid bus bar that goes to the battery management system. On the positive side, we've got dual four gauge wire coming into the battery and it's silicon coated. Going into the breaker, another nice solid bus bar. Down the bottom, we've got the communications panel and then up the top here, we've got the little LCD panel. So let's take this front part off and take a look what's actually inside. To remove the front panel, there's just three screws on either side and three screws underneath and before you take them off we've got to pop off the negative and the positive terminals or the cables uh, just out of interest we've got the battery management cables are above the bus bars i don't know if that matters but it'll matter to me putting it back together again all terminals are a 13 millimeter spanner and always try and use insulated when you have them says the man with no gloves. So we'll pull all that off very carefully. Somebody's gonna say you should have done the negative first. This is one-handed Pete. So I'm gonna tuck them down the bottom there. Pop that one off. With the bus bars freed from the batteries. We've just got to do those balance leads. I don't know how I'll get that on camera, but there is some sort of conformal coating on top of that to hold them on. So I'm going to have to peel that off a little bit. A few minutes later, and I did take some reference photos. It was quite the challenge to actually get those, those plugs off, which is kind of a good thing because in transit and stuff like that, if they come loose, that could be a big problem. That one actually popped up just a little bit which isn't a problem you just press it back down again but it does show how well that those battery connectors or the bms connectors to the balance leads were connected to the actual plugs themselves so with that done i should be able to release the two top screws carefully because it may fall i'm supporting the bottom of it and gently draw it away and there's one zip tie i missed for the second try and we slowly move it away with that zip tie released with the control panel removed very easy access to keep it clean or to actually do some more maintenance it might be easier to take that firewall out there's the three nuts on the bottom there and a couple of screws on the side it looks like that whole firewall would actually come out between the batteries and the control panel and it's nice heavy steel by the feel of it. It's probably about three, maybe two or three millimeters thick on that steel. About the same as the outside. This is definitely the part in every review video that I, I just dislike. For either fear or caution or panic of breaking such a valuable battery uh, is having a look at the electronics and how far do you pull it apart to take a look at it. Uh, what I can say is there is a fuse in line with that one. I don't know where that goes to. 
we'll have a look on the other side. That goes into the motherboard up here, so that's positive, so that probably senses the battery voltage, independent of the dual 4 gauge wire. And we've got the negative terminal, we've got the negative down the bottom coming out of the battery management system. And then that will be going up to the negative terminal there. We've got the positive coming into the bottom of the, the breaker and then coming out to the terminals at the top here. So let's see if we can take that breaker off and see if there's any markings on it. We do have a 250 amp sticker here. That looks like a QR code and a sticker down the bottom there. So we should be able to pull that off and take a better look. Oh, we've got the 250 amp breaker out. It was held in with just two screws here and here. And it was good to see that they actually held in with a long screw, but more so with one spring washer and a flat washer. Uh, much the same as the PCB here. The smaller screws here. Way there we go. Little spring washer. And then a little flat washer as well. So that good for a vibration. So let's have a look at this. A little sticker saying 250 amps. Uh, and a model number, a thousand volts, eight KVA or KV, no A after it. Some more information that I don't know or understand. If you do, please leave it in the comments below. DC 250 amps. We got the 18th of May 2023. Was it manufactured? So that is good to see. I don't know much about the unit itself. Uh, 40 degrees. Chint brand, C H I N T perhaps, and there's nothing on that side or along the bottom. So it looks like an M8 or an M10 bolt. So you've got three different ways of it connecting. We've got a little clip here, a little white plastic clip you press, and there's ribbon cable. You press the ends in to unhook it, and then this one was just glued in. So we have a look at that. Can we pull that up? We have got a couple of cables there that are still joined. Another one underneath. And then we've got the DC cables. We will leave the DC cables there just for ease of having a look. So, is there any information we can glean from this? We've got a little QR sticker here. Um, the whole board is conformally coated. You can see all the components are, are sort of shiny. That is to help against moisture. Carefully turning the board over on the other side. We've got a whole heap of MOSFETs. And we've got even got a CMOS battery at this end, so it keeps the um, the settings, I would assume. But there's nothing else I can glean from the back of that. There's no model numbers that I can see. Oh, we've got something here. SST21547-3. Uh, uh, this bottom board, which is a communication board, there's not much on there that I can see. A little QR code there, the ribbon cable that comes in, and the other cable. So that cable goes back, all, all three of those cables go back to the main board. Uh, we've got the power switch here, so that one turns it on and off. And looking at this board here, we've just got a cable here that's nice and neatly wrapped up. Up to the main board, so that's the, the display board. Interestingly, there's no obvious um, temperature sensors. So I'm assuming there's an actual, there's two actual temperature sensors on that board somewhere. Alternatively, they may be hidden somewhere up there, but I could only see the four when I had a glance at it before. Let's pop one of these covers off and take a look and see what's underneath. Underneath the cover, as you'd expect, it's just the battery management cables. They are well zip tied in. There doesn't look like there's any sharp edges or anything there. It's all very rounded over. I can run my fingers across there without any problems. Little vent holes for the vents of the actual batteries themselves are cut into the bottom plate. There's not too much more we can glean from that either. Little temperature probes there. Having a look at the battery management leads. If we can focus, maybe we've got the numbers stamped on them as well. So. Battery lead 16, 15, 14, etc. So it's, they put some real thought into building this battery. And so far, I've got to say that even though this is a sponsored battery, my experience with the previous Orient Power, and I've only got about 150 cycles on that, mainly in testing, not actually running my house or anything, lots and lots of battery tests, 
um, that I haven't done on video. I'm super happy with that battery and this one is just 2.0. So I'm going to put this one into production. I would like you guys to tell me what you think I should do with it. Personally, I think it is time that I replaced my 18650 DIY Powerwall with these two batteries. Ideally, we'd like two the same, but we can have this one. It'll just microcycle that one a little bit more but it should be fine for the short term until I can afford to buy a second battery. But let me know what you think, tubers. This will not be the last you see of this battery. I want to really put it to its tests, uh, run it through a heap of cycles. So even if you're not prepared to buy one of these batteries now, check back in other videos. I'll make sure I'll link them all below if I do any more battery videos with this particular battery, because I feel it is my own personal path forward away from the DIY 18650s and into a new era for Pete, Lifeboat 4. I still love you.